Welcome to the Holistic Psychiatry Podcast. I'm Courtney Snyder, a physician and holistic child and adult psychiatrist. In these next two episodes, I'll be talking about instances in which there is too much neurotransmitter activity. Remember, neurotransmitters are the chemicals in the brain that allow neurons to communicate with one another. So these are things like serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, and others. Too much of that communication between nerve cells can cause irritability, nervousness, or anxiety, and in some cases, panic, even mania or psychosis. Though we typically think of depression being due to low neurotransmitter activity, it can also be caused by too much. So if someone has depression with low neurotransmitter activity, there may be apathy. However, with too much, there could be sadness, and that depressive state could be more emotional. Similarly, people can have cognitive issues, problems with attention due to low neurotransmitter activity, but also due to there being too much. So it's important to look at all the symptoms that someone is having collectively. If we think energetically, if this person is turned up, having too much neurotransmitter activity versus being dialed down and having too little. And I'm, when I say energetically, I mean literally energetically because it is the excess neurotransmitter activity that is causing excessive electrical firing of neurons in the brain. In this episode, after briefly talking about the neurotransmitters, I'll discuss overmethylation. And then in the next episode, I'll talk about two instances in which neurotransmitters are not being broken down effectively. And I'll focus on two particular genes, the COMT gene and the MAOA, both of which play a role in breaking down or metabolizing neurotransmitters. And for each of these, I'll address associated symptoms, evaluation, and treatment. Before I talk about what various neurotransmitters do, I'm going to describe how they function in between nerve cells. So if you imagine a nerve cell being a long cell, and at one end there are receptors, and at the other end there are vesicles, or basically little bags holding neurotransmitters. And the space between the cells is called a synapse. And this is where the neurotransmitters are released into So they can bind a receptor on the next nerve cell. And when they bind that receptor on the next cell, an electrical impulse is sent down that long cell, which reaches the end and stimulates those vesicles to release neurotransmitters into the next synapse and then carry that message forward. At the synapse, however, there are also receptors for what are called transporters, that can pick up neurotransmitters, so take them back into that former cell and remove them from the synapse. So how many of these receptors with transporters we have on the original nerve cell can impact how much neurotransmitter there is available in the synapse to carry that message forward? So as you'll see when I talk about overmethylation, it's not necessarily about how much neurotransmitters are present or how much we have. It's also about how many receptors are available to reuptake or take those neurotransmitters back. The fewer of those receptors we have, the more neurotransmitters and the more neurotransmitter activity. So I'm going to talk about three specific neurotransmitters. So I'll start with uh, serotonin, which you can associate with well-being enjoyment, interest, our ability to experience joy and to fall asleep easily and maintain a restful sleep. If we're low in serotonin, we can have depression, loss of enjoyment, apathy. We may even have ruminations and worry. We can have problems falling asleep and falling into a deep restful sleep. If it's high, however, we can have irritability be easily agitated, anxious, quick to anger. Dopamine is the neurotransmitter associated with pleasure and reward. 
and attention and focus and memory and learning. Medications that target ADHD are really to enhance dopamine in the front of the brain. Dopamine is also involved in our motor circuits and so how we move. Those individuals who have Parkinson's disease, they have low dopamine in a particular part of the brain. In other circumstances, however, we could have low motivation, we could have difficulty finishing tasks, we could have social isolation and low stress tolerance, and we could also be stimulation-seeking as ways to raise that dopamine, and this could be various addictions and behavioral addictions. When it is high, we can have hyperactivity, be anxious, have problems sleeping, have increased or excessive drive to the point where perhaps we're manic. We could have paranoia and even OCD. Just as medications are used to enhance dopamine activity in the brain, there are also medications that will decrease dopamine activity, and this is typically in the form of antipsychotic medications. Lastly, I want to talk about norepinephrine, which is a neurotransmitter, and it's also converted to epinephrine. So we can kind of think of these as being related, and in some ways they are, and in some ways they operate independently. But norepinephrine impacts our mood, our reaction time, our level of arousal, so whether we have a lot of energy or whether we're lethargic, it sort of maintains that happy medium. And if we are low in norepinephrine, we can have low energy, be lethargic, depressed, have even ADHD-like symptoms, and low alertness. If it's high, we can have anxiety. We can also have aggression or be in a state of fight or flight. So that fight could be an aggressive type of state. And this doesn't have to be physical aggression. It could be verbal aggression or just a sense within the body. And we could also have associated with it physical symptoms that would come with a fight or flight response. So increased heart rate, maybe heart palpitation, sweating, nausea, perhaps headache. Uh, Epinephrine is typically released when we are in times of stress, and this will trigger within the body that fight-or-flight response. If it is high, we can have restlessness and anxiety. So when it comes to conditions in which there can be too much neurotransmitter activity, the first one I'm going to talk about is overmethylation. And this understanding comes out of the Walsh Research Institute, where they studied the nutrient levels of over 30,000 people with brain-related symptoms. And they found that the same culprits kept coming up, and there weren't many. And I talk about this in the episode related to Dr. William Walsh and the Walsh Research Institute. One of those neurotransmitter imbalances related to a methylfolate imbalance, and there can be an excess methyl or with a folate deficiency, as is the case with overmethylation. In a previous episode, I talked about where there's a deficiency of methyl and an excess of folate, and this is what we see in undermethylation. And in undermethylation, it's a very sort of low neurotransmitter phenomenon. And so we would consider this almost the opposite. Overmethylation can result in too much neurotransmitter activity. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, this can relate to there not being enough reuptake of the neurotransmitters. Having too few reuptake receptors can result in excessive neurotransmitters at the synapse. And one of the things that affects how many of these receptors we have is actually folate. So if we have a folate deficiency, we will have fewer of these receptors reuptaking the neurotransmitters and then have too much of that neurotransmitter activity. So both over and under methylation are impacted by a number of genes that collectively determine where we fall on this methylation spectrum. 
And while there can be a genetic vulnerability, there are also things such as toxicity that impact the expression or turning on and off of particular genes. So there is not a, a singular gene for overmethylation. You can start to imagine what those symptoms, not only symptoms, but also personality traits could look like for someone with high activity. And just as with undermethylation, overmethylation does not have to be pathologic. Uh, it certainly raises one's vulnerability to symptoms, but with it does come a number of strengths. Usually people that are overmethylated are highly artistic or have musical ability. Uh, they also have high empathy for others. They're sort of your good neighbor. They're not uh, particularly competitive, which makes them better at collaborating. Some of the challenges, however, can be high anxiety, panic, hyperactivity. In some cases, there can even be sleep disorders. There can be psychosis in some individuals, again, from this excessive neurotransmitter activity. Previously, in the data collected from the Walsh Research Institute, this was the most common underlying root cause from a nutrient standpoint of schizophrenia. However, the percentage of overmethylated individuals in the schizophrenia population has decreased quite, quite dramatically, so that now most individuals with schizophrenia are actually undermethylated. There can be food and chemical sensitivities, but an absence of seasonal allergies. There can be an adverse response to medications that would increase serotonin activity. So this could be things like Prozac, Paxil, Zoloft, Celexa, Lexapro, and an adverse reaction to things like methionine and SAMe. The incidence of overmethylation in those with panic attacks is actually 64%. In those with schizophrenia, it's now 10%. In those with ADHD, it's 28%. And in those with depression, it's 18%. And the way we identify if someone might be under or over-methylated is through a whole blood histamine. So if someone is over-methylated, and again, too much neurotransmitter activity, we would expect that histamine level to be low. Because again, we need methyl to break down histamine. If someone's on medication that could be lowering that histamine level and therefore we may not get a good read, we can do a doctor's data methylation panel to look at the various components of the methylation cycle without the interference of medication. Treatment includes therapies aimed to increase folate, and through the Walsh Research Institute protocols, we use folic acid. We also use niacin in the form of niacinamide, which will actually promote dopamine reuptake, and we use B12, and there are a number of other uh, supportive nutrients that can be very helpful, including choline, antioxidants, and usually we're also optimizing zinc levels and using a combination of B6 and P5P, if not just P5P alone. And there are things that we would avoid, SSRIs or medications for those who are seeing psychiatrists that are prescribing medications, and we would avoid using supplements like SAMe, methionine, but also tryptophan, 5-HTP. Dietarily, these individuals will do better on a high folate diet. Um, we get folate from sort of our leafy green vegetables, and a relatively low protein diet because methyl is where it comes from protein, as do some of these amino acids, which can become problematic. So a primarily vegetarian diet is actually what's most beneficial. And here I will say, with all the fad diets and all the People saying you should be vegetarian, you should be vegan, you should be zero carb, you should be a carnivore diet, paleo diet. Just recognize that 
There is no ideal diet that is going to suit all of us. And it may even be within our lifetime that our needs change, given how the expression of some of our genes can change. So just always be leery of that information and also really learn to listen to your body. And that doesn't mean to become fearful of food or uh, overly vigilant, but just to notice what types of food you feel good when you eat and what types of food you don't. But if you have symptoms of overmethylation, and uh, some of these are going to overlap with the other topics that I'll get to, and they also relate to uh, difficulties with a high-protein diet. In the next episode, I'll talk about two genetic variants, specifically on the COMT and MAOA genes. These are genes responsible for the metabolism of neurotransmitters, so breaking them down. And in the case of COMT, it also is involved with metabolizing estrogen. So if these genes have a variant that's resulting in a sluggish enzyme, then we can end up with higher neurotransmitter activity and, in the case of COMT, potentially higher estrogen for women. The incidence of these are seemingly much more common than overmethylation, and because they can occur with undermethylation, where normally there's low neurotransmitter activity, uh, there can be a confusing picture of both being undermethylated but having high neurotransmitter symptoms. So I'll talk about this more in the next episode. If you're interested in subscribing to hear more about these podcasts, please visit my website at CourtneySnyderMD.com where I also have blog posts and links to other episodes related to the root causes of brain-related symptoms. And if you'd like to help me get this information out into the world, please consider liking, commenting, or sharing. I'm currently on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, and look forward to connecting with you there or on a future podcast. Until then, take care.